Okay, so I think it's about 1030 now and uh, we're going to get started on topic two. So welcome back. I uh, hope your week has been good. Uh, today we're going to talk about classifying infectious organisms and we're also going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the quiz that's on Tuesday. So let's get right into this. I'm hoping some of this will be review for you. And um, if not, uh, then it's good time to get caught up because uh, we're going to be talking a lot about these things in the next few weeks. And, it's a, and so it'll be good that you, uh, you know what we're talking about with just some basic cell biology. So first is, what is a cell? I know everyone's thinking, you know, all about cells. You talked about them since about grade four. And uh, we're going to just, uh, you know, look, look at them in a little bit of detail uh, today. Um, and you're probably thinking, you know, some of the definitions of a cell that you talk about, again, going back to grade four, uh, you probably equate them to something like uh, Lego blocks. Uh, they're the building blocks of the cell or, the, or of, uh, of an organism, of all living things. So why, why do, what do we mean by building blocks? We mean they're, they're capable of carrying out all of life's basic functions. So if you think about all of life's basic functions, you got things like uh, respiration, photosynthesis. Uh, you've got uh, uh, our body have structural components, and cells are really the building blocks of all those things. Now, of course, sometimes a living organism can be many cells. A human body is about thirty-seven trillion cells. It's a big number. I can't count that high. Uh, and some organisms are one cell. So we're going to be looking at uh, both of those type of things. I just got to admit a few people to the meeting. Here we go. Uh, so what are these functions that we're talking about? We're talking about providing structure. I guess I mentioned this already. Um, energy metabolism. And of course, one of the more important things uh, biologically is that cells contain uh, DNA, which is the hereditary material. So a little bit of biology. You can look at biology from a larger level. Uh, we could go much bigger than this. We could talk about ecosystems and populations and the biosphere. Uh, we're really mostly in this class focusing on organism level. Uh, so if you look at an organism, there's our cow. Cow says moo. Cow is going to have organ systems. Those organ systems are going to be made of organs. So in this case, you can see we're looking at a digestive system which in a cow's case includes four stomachs and intestines, and of course the uh, mouth and esophagus. Organs are made out of tissues. Tissues are, are a bunch of cells of uh, similar uh, um, types. And then of course, tissues are made of cells. So there's our little cell, the building block of all life. We are going to uh, zoom in. And we're going to talk about things that are smaller than cells, components of cells. So we have things like organelles. We have uh, organelles are made of their own structures. So in that case, you're looking at a phospholipid membrane. And of course, that phospholipid membrane is made up of uh, several macromolecules. So like I said, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour through the cell. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, like I said, it's review for everybody. If you do have some issues or questions, uh, always feel free to come, um, come talk to me. Or, uh, or send me an email. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to uh, just going to take a look at these cells here and uh, I want to uh, actually make some notes on some of the different components of the cells, uh, mostly the components that we care about in this class. Uh, for example, we're not really going to be talking about the Golgi body uh, in this class, uh, but we are going to talk about the nucleus and a few other things as well. So you can see you have two cell types there. I've got the eukaryotic cell on the left and the prokaryotic cell on the right. Uh, I'm going to talk about the differences between those two uh, in a few minutes, but probably you know that the eukaryotic cell has a nucleus and the prokaryotic cell does not. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these components here. I'm going to discuss them briefly and then I'll make some notes for you. So if you have a piece of paper ready, uh, you, can, you can make the notes along with me uh, once we get to that point. So if you take a look here, the most notable thing again about the eukaryotic cells is the nucleus. But prokaryotic cells also have uh, DNA, just not found in a membrane uh, nucleus. So what is the nucleus? Everyone talks about it being the brain of the cell. It's not like it necessarily makes decisions, 
but it has information. It's more like the blueprints. These are the instructions. It's the instruction manual for making more cells, more cell parts, and uh, I guess what to do in certain circumstances. So genes can be turned on and off uh, in different environmental conditions and things like that. Um, sorry, I pressed the button to the next one. We have ribosomes. Ribosomes are protein factories. Ribosomes are these little spots that you see all over the place. You can see there's little spots. See my pen doesn't seem to work in there. We have little spots here, little spots there. There should be ribosomes all over in the cytoplasm. They're just not showing it. I'll draw a few in in red. They should be all over the place uh, in the cell. The uh, prokaryotic cell also has uh, ribosomes, of course. The cytoplasm, that's really the liquid that's containing the cell. Like I said, I'll give you guys some notes and definitions on these in a minute here. Uh, the plasma membrane. Um, so this is usually the term biologists use. I know a lot of students like to call it the cell membrane. Um, but if you take a look at our eukaryotic cell, it has many cell membranes. There's membranes all over the place. There's a membrane around the Golgi body, a membrane around the mitochondria. Uh, so the plasma membrane means it's the membrane that's containing the cytoplasm. So it's the, it's the cell membrane, really. And that's just keeping things out and regulating transport of goods in and out of the cell. We also have lysosomes. You may not be familiar with that one. Lys means breaking or digesting. And so that's really what a lysosome is. It's kind of like a little stomach. It's actually acidic, just like our stomachs, and it digests uh, nutrients. And in the case of um, uh, in the case of immune cells, it's actually going to be digesting uh, invaders, whatever it's it's di digesting itself. Uh, so you can see these cells also have uh, cilia. It's mentioned here on the eukaryotic cell, and a flagellum mentioned here on the prokaryotic cell. Cilia is here and flagellum. Um, eukaryotic cells can also have flagella. Flagellum is one, flagella is, is plural. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a lot about flagella and flagellums. Flagellum and flagella. <laughs> flagella is the plural. We'll talk a lot about them uh, in, in future lectures, but they're basically there for helping these things to swim around. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to switch. Uh, what I'm sharing my screen, and I am going to uh, make some notes on some of these things here, just so we can slow down and and uh, gather our thoughts on these things. So I encourage you to take some notes as well uh, on these things, and if you know what they are, great. Um, but uh, you know, just helping us to think through these things. So what did we say about the nucleus? We said the nucleus is a membrane, membrane bound organelle that contains, oops, I guess I got to make sure I can spell. I used to be able to spell, I swear. Something happened in about 2018, I can't spell anymore. Um, so it contains the genome, which of course is just another name for basically saying it's the DNA or the chromosomes. They all have slightly different meanings, but that is the genetic material that we care about. So what are the chromosomes or the DNA? So these contain the instructions for building, let's say, contain the instructions for the cell for new proteins, enzymes, and other things, we'll say. Big long list we could we could really put there, but I'm not going to uh, not going to get any more detail than that at least today anyway. So ribosomes, these are the site of a process called translation. Okay, I will underline that for you. Translation. We're going to talk about translation in a few minutes. And what is translation? Translation is protein synthesis. Okay, uh, let's see here. Cytoplasm. So cytoplasm, this is the fluid or liquid that is contained within the plasma membrane.
and maybe I'll make a second note. It contains organelles, enzymes, RNA, water, solutes, and all sorts of other goodies. So I'm going to move up a little bit here. Got a couple more to go here. So we have the cell membrane, plasma membrane. So I'm probably going to use the term plasma membrane, but like I said, you can use the term, use it interchangeably with cell membrane. So this is in a eukaryotic cell, at least the outermost. Uh, the outermost membrane that contains the cell contents. Second note is responsible for allowing nutrients in and out of the cell and also interacts with the environment. Something we probably don't think about a lot, at least in normal biology classes, about what the cell membrane is doing. But the, the cell surface is actually very important for uh, uh, organisms interacting uh, with their environment. If you think about microorganisms, um, you know, that's basically their skin. Uh, you know, this is how they're interacting with your digestive tract or your nasal passage or whatever area that they might be uh, trying to infect. All right, lysosome. Like I said, we can call these here cellular stomachs. So what do I mean by that? So these are digestive compartments. So they can digest food or uh, in the case of, uh, I'll just type that in, in the case of white blood cells, immune cells, and digest invading pathogens. All right, so cilia and flagella, both of those are plural for cilium and flagellum. We'll get into those a bit more later, but I'll uh, write a definition for you. So we'll call these finger-like or tail-like. Finger-like in the case of cilia and tail-like in the case of flagella. So these are projections on the surface. Uh, there we go again. Either can't type or can't spell. Surface of the cell used for movement. You can think of it as kind of like swimming. Ah, there's one more on there. Maybe I forgot to highlight uh, uh, that on the, the pictures. Uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. But the cell wall, cell walls are found in some cells, not all cells. And uh, so bacterial cells have them, animal cells do not, for example. And uh, so this is kind of uh, a little extra layer of protection. So these are rigid. So rigid covering of the cell that is outside the cell membrane. supports the cell shape and protects the cell. Okay, so hopefully you got all of those. Uh, I'm gonna move back to the, uh, the pictures in a moment. Uh, you know, this is the case where I'm just trying to figure out, usually I do all this on the whiteboard. And uh, so, you know, we're adapting. Hopefully you can adapt too. Like I said, it's important for you to take notes. Uh, in the classes uh, so you retain things. So even if you don't look at the notes later, I do encourage that you do take them. It will help you retain some of the uh, uh, some of the stuff that we're talking about. All right, let me go back to the PowerPoint. There we go, and it looks like I do have the cell wall uh, right here labeled. It's labeled on the, uh, on the bacterium there. So you may notice on the bacterium, it's talking about an inner membrane and and that's something we're not going to talk about this week, but we will get to that. Uh, some bacterial species do have two membranes, by the way. Uh, but at the moment, just think of that as the plasma membrane. And uh, you'll get by just fine. 
So here's a picture I wanted to show you. This is uh, um, drawn by an artist, uh, David Goodsell, and he does lots of sciencey kind of things. He's actually a biochemist, and he was drawing a picture of E. coli. So I wanted to share this with you because I thought it was really cool. I know when we think about the cytoplasm, usually we're thinking about uh, all this liquid and there's not much else in there. And he's trying to show you that no, cells are loaded with all sorts of things. So if you take a look at this E. coli picture, uh, he has a few things there uh, and he's gone through and he's tried to make it as accurate as possible to uh, what we know about the biology and structures of these things. So there's a cell membrane, for example. Uh, these uh, purple things are ribosomes. You can see the little uh, protein strand is being made uh, uh, in that image. Chromosomes there, the DNA is in, uh, is in yellow. And uh, actually, if you look really carefully at that picture, let me just see something here. I'll go back to that in a second. Uh, if you look really carefully on this picture here, this is actually DNA polymerase here. I'm going to circle it. If you look, you've got one DNA strand going in and two DNA strands uh, coming out. So that's pretty cool. He also has a, a cell wall up there. Cell walls made out of peptidoglycan. We'll talk about what that is uh, in a bit. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. But take a look at the word. It's peptide, peptidoglycan. So it does have a meaning. We will talk about that. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about, and I have a few slides on these, and then I'll also make some notes uh, like I had just done, uh, was transmission of information in cells. Uh, so I, I, I dropped some of these words already. I think I mentioned translation, uh, ribosomes, uh, a few things like that. This is information, how it goes from DNA to RNA to protein. So if you think about DNA, DNA is the instruction manual. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of instructions. It's big and thick, and it's a, it's a permanent record. Uh, RNA is kind of like a, a sticky note. Uh, you know, it's, it's a message, a memo, an email, that kind of thing. It's a lot more temporary, and it says basically to build that protein. And the protein is what uh, functions in the cell and, and does what needs to get done. So it could be an enzyme or could be could be something else. So let's talk a little bit about these processes and we will uh, review them again. It's really important you know about these processes, particularly when we're talking about uh, things like viruses, which is topic six. Uh, and so I'll come back and kind of review these a little bit. So first one is replication. Sometimes it's called DNA replication. Sometimes it's just called replication. So this is where you take one copy of your uh, DNA. So that's being shown here on the right. And you're making two copies. So one copy here and two daughter strands there. So we've got two copies. Uh, I'm not going to go over the details of replication uh, at all. You can um, take other classes for that. But what I really want you to know is what replication is. You're copying your DNA. You're making, making two copies from one. The other thing to know is this here, right there. That's the enzyme that does it, DNA polymerase. So most enzymes, if they're named carefully, they're uh, given a name that's actually uh, uh, somewhat respective of, of what they actually do. So this is making a polymer of DNA. So it's actually a pretty good name. Second uh, process I want you to know is transcription. So if you think about a scribe, a scribe is copying something. So in this case, that's kind of what is going on is uh, we're making an RNA copy of the DNA template. So RNA is slightly different. You probably know that RNA has uh, uracil or U instead of thymine or T. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit when we, when we get to the virus unit. Um, but really scribing is copying and, and you're really using the same language. Nucleotide is the language here, going from nucleotide to nucleotide. You can see the enzyme here is called RNA polymerase because this time we're making RNA and not DNA. So there's a little picture of the process happening. You can see the DNA is getting unspooled and we got this little strand of RNA being produced. All right, the last process to mention is translation. So now we are actually going from one language to another. So translate is actually a good word to use for this. We're going from the language of nucleotides to the language of proteins. So proteins are made of amino acids, not nucleic acids. So it is a bit of a different process. Again, I'm not going into the detail on this in this class. I just want you to know the basics and the definition of this. Uh, and you can see, uh, let me see here, do I have a, it's circled, so ribosomes. 
So these things here are ribosomes. You can see they have a large subunit here and a small subunit uh, down here. And there's a little thing Blaine, here. quick question. Yeah, yeah. For the quiz, so we're not going to have to worry about like the charts and trans translating things and all of that jazz? No, okay. no I do have a list at the end of this PowerPoint uh, of what's going to be on the quiz. I apologize, I meant to post it before class and then my phone rang and I forgot, but I, there is a list at the end of the PowerPoint. Okay, perfect, thank you. you but yeah, you don't need to know the steps or the details. I'm not going to give you a genetic code and make you uh, do, translate anything. Um, I want you to know the definition. The, the quiz, by the way, is going to be uh, uh, basically a 10 multiple choice question. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some sample questions uh, at the end here. So just finishing off, you can see that right here, these are little amino acids and they're growing from the ribosome. There is the genetic code. Uh, and uh, just uh, emphasizing, like I said, you're going from one language to another. This is the code, the translation going from uh, the nucleotides to the, um, uh, to the amino acids. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write some notes on each of those processes. Uh, let me go back to my Word document. And uh, so what did we have? We had replication, transcription, and translation. So I think I've got, a, got that started on the next page. So cellular processes. So replication. So this is the process where one parent strand of DNA is separated and made into two strands we'll call it daughter DNA maybe in brackets we'll see if the genome is, is copied my blue font disappeared I was trying to just make it distinct of what's going what uh, let's see here I can Change that to blue. The genome is copied. The principal enzyme is DNA polymerase. Okay, and I will underline that. It's a good thing to remember. So transcription is where RNA is synthesized using a DNA template. So I know sometimes, you know, you, uh, people are thinking about messenger RNA and uh, uh, transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA. Um, don't want you to focus on that too much. All, all types of RNA are made by transcription. The messenger RNA is of course the type that is used for translation and making amino acids. Um, but uh, I'm not expecting you to really, in this class anyway, really distinguish between the different types of RNA. So the enzyme is RNA polymerase. I will underline that as well. There we go. All right, and the last process is translation. So this is protein synthesis. So in this case here, we have an amino acid chain so you can also call that a peptide or if it's long enough you could call it a protein is made using the sequence found on messenger rna so mrna we call that this is done on the ribosome. Make it blue, there we go. So we'll go into these processes in just a tiny bit more detail, um, mostly just to review them when we talk about viruses. Because um, virus genomes, we can have DNA and RNA, 
and there's uh, some complicated things going on. So I just want to uh, um, just want to make sure you understand what's what's going on here. I see there's a question here. Somebody says, can we say the genome contains genetic information? You certainly can. In fact, the genome, by definition, is all of the genetic information found in the cell. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, these two types of cells, and I will make some notes on these as well. Um, we've got our eukaryote and our prokaryote. These are some electron micrograph images, by the way. And uh, usually when you look at these kind of things, you, you can see there's two huge differences. One is eukaryotic cells are larger than prokaryotic cells. And two, eukaryotic cells have um, a nucleus. So that's right in the name, by the way. So here, let me write this out for you. So you karyote. So this is Greek, by the way, and this means true. And karyote means nucleus. So it's right in the name. What's a eukaryote? It's a cell that has a true nucleus or a nucleus. I don't think there's any prokaryotic cells that I know of that have any sort of even fake nucleus. Um, but sometimes the DNA is kind of uh, densely found in the middle, so it might look like a nucleus, but there's no membrane around it. Prokaryote, if you look at the name of that, we've got prokaryote, so we know that this means nucleus. And pro actually means before in Greek. So whoever named these was thinking about in terms of, uh, uh, you know, believing that uh, prokaryotic cells are, are more uh, primitive and evolutionarily uh, existed before eukaryotes. So that's where the name uh, was inspired from. So by the way, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about eukaryotes and bacteria and prokaryotes and all those kind of things. Uh, just kind of a disclaimer in biology. You know, I, I said that eukaryotic cells are larger than prokaryotic cells. Most sentences in biology, you can probably put the word usually in front of that. So I can say eukaryotic cells are usually bigger than prokaryotic cells. There's always in biology, the amazing thing in biology is there always seems to be weird and wonderful exceptions to the rules. Um, so just keep that in mind, you know, uh, and uh, if I do contradict myself once in a while, sometimes that's the reason why, or sometimes I do make mistakes, just let me know and ask questions to clarify. But uh, the word usually uh, certainly can come around uh, uh, quite a bit. I have another picture for you here. This is the ones from the textbook. Uh, these are the cartoons. I showed you these already. You can see the nucleus in the eukaryotic cell on the left, uh, no nucleus uh, in the eukaryotic cell on the right. Uh, I am going to be talking about these in, in a bit more detail over the next few weeks. Uh, right now, though, I am going to make a few notes for you, just really the basics. Uh, and uh, when we come back to this, I'll, I'll fill in uh, a few more details. Uh, so the way I think about it is, you know, I'm going to make a table right now for you and uh, we'll continue that table with more details as we as we go along uh, with the course. So let me make a little table just kind of uh, uh, comparing the prokaryotics and eukaryotes and I've got that started right here. So prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Okay, so typical size, there's the two things I talked about, right? The difference is size and membrane. Um, so prokaryote, typical size, you know, we're looking at, you know, one to 10 micrometers. So that's pretty small. That's getting down to really the limits of uh, light microscopy. A light microscope can get down to maybe half a micrometer in terms of its resolution. A eukaryote, animal cell is maybe around 50 micrometers, and uh, you know these can be huge, uh, but kind of typical sizes are 50 to 200 uh, micrometers. So 200 micrometers are actually big enough that our, our actual eyeballs can see them, and there's actually quite a number of cell types that our eyes can see. Uh, human ovum is about 100 micrometers within uh, kind of, you know, it looks like the smallest speck your eye can see, but your eye can, can see them. Uh, there's several amoebas and uh, all sorts of cells that are actually much larger than, than 200 micrometers, but that just kind of gives you an idea of the size. 
plant cells can be actually uh, really massive in some cases. Uh, Membrane-bound nucleus, this is just a yes or a no. So a no and a yes, right? It's all in the name, eukaryote, true nucleus. So what else do I have here? I have a few other um, items to this table. And uh, like I said, this is just kind of a basic list and we will uh, be discussing these in a lot of detail in the next few weeks. And I will add to this, add to the more details to this table. Uh, other membrane or bound organelles, no, at least not usually. There are a few weird exceptions in the bacterial world. And in eukaryotes, yes. So cell wall. Okay, so yes for, for prokaryotes. And I'm going to actually put a little bit of detail here. Because we are going to be discussing bacteria in a lot of detail. And bacteria have something called peptidoglycan. So there's that word again. Uh, good word to learn. We're going to talk a lot about peptidoglycan. It actually is the uh, target of penicillin. Uh, so it's an important word because we're going to be talking a lot about uh, penicillin. Uh, eukaryotes, it's not a yes or no, it's a sometimes. So animals, that's us, there's no cell wall. There are other types of eukaryotes though, plants. Of course, plants don't usually infect us. Uh, we're not gonna talk really about them in this class in any detail, but if you must know, plants have cellulose and that's something, oops, that's something you may have heard of. We are gonna talk about fungi though, and fungi have something that's kind of like cellulose and it's called chitin. And uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into that uh, in the next, next few weeks. Um, I'm also going to talk about protists. I haven't really discussed what a protist is quite yet, but we'll get there in a few minutes. Um, I'm just going to say huge variety here. Protists are kind of a funny group of, uh, of organisms. Uh, they, um, some of them have cell walls, some of them don't have cell walls. Uh, some of them have cellulose, some of them have chitin. A lot of them have weird things that you don't see anywhere else in the, uh, in the biological world. All right, last one, examples. Okay, so uh, I mentioned bacteria already. So I'm going to just give you an example of bacteria such as E. coli. And the other group of prokaryotes are something called archaea, and I'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but they are distinct biochemically uh, from bacteria. Eukaryotes, I guess we've mentioned a bunch of them already. Animals, plants, fungi, protists. So I'm sure everybody can think of an animal, plant, or fungi example. Protists, I'll give you an example, such as an amoeba. So that might be something that you're familiar with, at least from... Uh, high school biology. Okay, like I said, this is just a beginning. Uh, you know, I'm gonna be filling in a lot more details in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I think next week we're gonna talk about bacteria and the following week we're gonna talk about protists and fungi. Uh, so as we uh, get into that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flesh out this table and, and start adding a lot more details. Any questions at this point? I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. So there's our picture of our, our prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Let me see here, I think I see, is that a question there? What about neurons? They are one cell and they can be huge. Yes, neurons are a good exception. I think the longest neuron goes from the back of your spine to the tip of your toe. So that's like a, you know, depending on your height, that can be like a, a meter long. Uh, somebody's asking about cell division. Uh, that is something we will talk about. Uh, eukaryotes do mitosis and meiosis and prokaryotes don't. Uh, so that's something else to uh, uh, think about, but we're not going to really talk about that today. Uh, somebody says, what is the difference in chromosomes? Um, again, uh, those are some details we're going to look at. Um, bacteria, for example, usually have one chromosome and eukaryotic cells often have many. So humans have 46 chromosomes. Um, but that's for future lectures. So we'll get, we'll get into those details uh, a little bit later on. But thanks for the questions. Keep them coming, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Okay, so prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So another way to think about organisms is how we classify them, and this is a little bit something I do want to talk about today. So prokaryotic cells, there's, there's uh, two types. Um, there's the bacteria and the archaea, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the differences here and there, but mostly we're going to be talking about bacteria in this class. Archaea, as far as we know, don't seem to make us sick. Uh, the eukaryotes, uh, they include the animals, plants, fungi, protists, algae. Sometimes people include the algae with the protists. Sometimes people group them in their own group because they're photosynthetic, but then there's a lot of pho photosynthetic uh, uh, protists uh, as it is. Um, I'm not really going to be talking about kingdoms. I know a lot of high school teachers really like to talk about kingdoms, but uh, a lot of biologists who classify things can't necessarily agree on what kingdom things belong in in a lot of cases, except for the really uh, uh, main examples of animals, plants, and fungi. After that, when you get to bacteria and protists, the whole thing around kingdom, there's a lot of arguments and it gets really messy. So sometimes it's not really worth it to talk about kingdoms. There are some other uh, life forms or self-replicating entities I'm going to talk about viruses and prions uh, and they're not cells and they're not considered to be living so more on those later so here's kind of one of these tree of life things I wanted to just uh, show this to you for a minute because uh, like I said you know bacteria and archaea so there's our bacteria there's our archaea uh, are considered separate domains and a lot of this is biochemical. If you take a look at the fossil lipids, they're very different in archaea compared to the bacteria. If you take a look at things like uh, 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 transcription and replication, the processes and the enzymes are a little different. Uh, so archaea, it turns out biologically, are their own little bunch. They're very similar to bacteria in that they're prokaryotes. I think I have that listed here. The prokaryotes and they're small, uh, but biochemically, they're very, very different. We're not really going to talk about archaea in this class because you can see I have this big note here. No known pathogens. So they don't seem to make us sick. So biologically, it's not that it makes them less interesting. It just means that uh, for this class, we're mostly going to skip over them. Uh, the, there's the eukaryotes uh, up at the top. And uh, many kingdoms. We're going to be talking about animals and fungi. We're going to be talking about amoebas. We're not going to talk about uh, land. Plants, but you can see there's a few other things, dinoflagellates and ciliates. Remember what flagella are. These are things that can swim around, uh, and, and many of them will uh, swim around and make you sick. We also have the trypanosomes. So if you've heard of African sleeping sickness, uh, that, um, that's uh, what a trypanosome uh, causes. So let's talk a little bit about classification of these things. I, I don't really want to get into, you know, phylums and classes and orders and all those kind of things, uh, but uh, really just the basics, okay? I want you to know, uh, you know, uh, about your organism, what is it? Is it bacteria? Is it a fungi? Is it a virus? Is it a protist? Uh, those are kind of the main things that I'm looking at. And plus, I want you to understand how the naming system works, which is more important than this. But I'll give you a couple of examples just so you see how this works. You probably know a little bit about taxonomy. Uh, taxonomy, uh, there's the word up at the top. Taxonomy basically means classification based usually on physical, but sometimes chemical traits as well. So here's an example, a human. So what domain are we? Are we a eukaryote, a bacteria, or an archaea? Hopefully that one's obvious. Our cells have nuclei, which means we are eukaryotes. Uh, sometimes people would kind of use the Greek word, you know, version eukarya, and, uh, uh, but you usually you can figure out what it is. What kingdom are we? We're animals. Um, so what is an animal? An animal is a, is a heterotroph. That means we, we feed on other things and we're multicellular. Uh, by the way, uh, fungi can fall into that category, at least some of them. Uh, but there's other things about animals. For example, we can move around. We're motile and and uh, you know, there's a, there's a number of characteristics that make us animals. What phylum are we in? We're, we're in the chordata. We have a, uh, a nerve cord. What class? We're mammals. Mammals have a number of distinct things around them. They have hair. Uh, the word mammal refers to mammary glands. So we feed milk to our young, uh, and that's what makes us mammals. We're also primates. Primates because we have opposable thumbs. Um, there's a few other reasons why we're primates, but that's one of them. Uh, there is another group of animals that have uh, opposable thumbs. 
um, but the bone structure is actually quite a bit different. So they're not primates. And um, I don't know if anyone knows what I'm referring to. Any guesses? Pandas and raccoons. What family are in? We are in the hominids. So we have a large brain case and no tail. That makes us an ape too, by the way, no tail. What genus are we in? You probably know we are Homo sapiens. So Homo means human and sapiens, well, we got to name ourselves, so we call ourselves wise or, or, or sentient, which means thinking, right? Um, so we're Homo sapiens. Uh, and you probably you probably knew that already. So what do I care about here, right? I care about you know the species name, which is the genus and species. Uh, we put those two things together. I'll come back to that in a minute. I care, you know it's important to know that we're eukaryotes. It's also important to know that we're animals. Everything else in the middle is just uh, you know maybe for other classes uh, they care about it a bit more, uh, but it's really not so important uh, in this class. Let me give you another example. And you can see how things get divided in the uh, uh, biological kingdom. Uh, here's a dog, right? So a dog is a eukaryote. Yeah, it's an animal. Uh, in fact, it's a mammal. So it has all those things that are uh, similar to humans, right? But after that, it, it gets divided a little bit. The order, it's a carnivore. And uh, it has a, a different te teeth structure, dogs do. What family is in? Something called the canines. And... Uh, <laughs> I was actually looking into this. The only thing I could find was a canine means dog-like. So there you go. And that includes foxes, but not hyenas, interestingly. Uh, so our genus is canis, which means dog. And the species is lupus, which means wolf. So yeah, you probably knew this. Dogs and wolves are actually the same species. They can breed together and and uh, that's where dogs came from. They're originally wild uh, wolves. So just want to point something out here. Maybe uh, some of you have heard of this uh, little book and movie series called Harry Potter. And you may remember, uh, what was his name? Professor Lupin. Right? So look at that. And what do you know about Professor Lupin? Professor Lupin was a werewolf. And so there was actually a hint right in the name at the right at the beginning when you first meet the character. Something kind of cool. So by the way, sometimes we go a little further and we talk about subspecies because there are differences between dogs and wolves. And so uh, the domestic dog, we call it the anus lupus familiaris, which means that it is uh, domesticated or, or friendly in this case. I think I see a chat, somebody says that's awesome. Yeah, it is pretty cool. You, know, you learn things every day, or hopefully at least you do in my class. Um, it says here, are we going to need to give examples for each category for the quiz? Uh, the quiz is multiple choice, so if, if there are examples, it might be provided uh, for you. Um, I'll, I'll try not to answer too many quiz questions until we get to the end of the lecture, because I do have a list there, and hopefully it'll be uh, clear uh, what exactly I'm looking for for the quiz. Okay, I do have another example here. Going to share with you. So we're going to go somewhere entirely different, and I want to give an example um, of a bacterium. So this is totally different right from the beginning. This is a different domain, right? So remember what uh, uh, we were eukaryotes. We had a nucleus. Well, what's different about bacteria? They have no nucleus, and they also have a certain type of fossil lipid that is different from the archaea. So kingdom, gram-positive, I haven't talked about what this means, but we will talk a lot about gram-positives. It means they have a thick cell wall. Firmicutes, uh, low G and C in the DNA. So I'm not sure exactly how that people figured this out, but people were looking at genomes and realized that some organisms have more G and C, and I guess that ended up being a characteristic that makes these ones separate. Cilli based on the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Vacillates also based on the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. So sometimes it gets a little harder with bacteria. Many, many of them look like exactly what I'm showing you in this slide here. They're little round things and uh, you know they don't have hair, they don't feed milk to their young, they, they don't have certain teeth. So you know we have to go deeper and start to look at the biochemistry and sometimes the, uh, uh, the genomes on these things. 
So what family are they in? They're in something called Staphylococcus or Staphylococcus. The CA, I guess that is. So staph, you can see, means cluster. And caucus means sphere. So the cells are all spheres and they're clustered together kind of like this. They look like a little bunch of grapes. So the genus is Staphylococcus, which means the same thing. Uh, this is a very, very large group of gram-positive organisms and the species is Epidermidus. So there's the name. Staphylococcus epidermidus, and right in the name we can tell from this that it's staph, they're clustered spheres, caucus, and epidermidus, well that means skin. So this is something that lives on your skin. So if we're lucky, the name of an organism is descriptive and it tells you uh, uh, a little bit about it. Uh, sometimes we're not always so lucky, we run out of names or, or ideas I guess, but uh, I'll get into uh, some of the naming conventions in a moment here. So let's talk about what a species is. Uh, if, you, if you Google species uh, or look it up in a dictionary, it's gonna talk about uh, uh, interbreeding and things like that. Uh, and so you can see on the, on the uh, slide there, it says bi biologically a species is usually defined as a population whose members can interbreed. So, so f f um, you know, a wolf and a dog can breed, but a wolf and a fox cannot. So therefore, a fox is a different species. That's kind of the logic behind that. Although, again, there's lots of weird exceptions and whatnot, uh, you know, that it, it, things get muddied sometimes, uh, you know, where you have some species that will breed sometimes and sometimes they don't. Or some species can't breed together because, uh, uh, you know, but they might do it on a farm, for example, right? You know, if you think about uh, zebras and horses, I'll get, that, get back to that in a moment. Uh, I see there's a question here. Someone says, isn't Staphylococcus strep throat? Um, no, actually, uh, strep throat is caused by streptococcus. So strep means a chain, not a cluster. Um, but we will, we will certainly be talking about streptococcus. Uh, don't worry, we will get there. So let's just take a look at an example of two species. There's a donkey, that's a species, and a horse, that's a species. And you may know what happens when you put these two together on a farm, you get a mule. So here's the thing. A mule is not a species because mules themselves cannot interbreed. They're not breedable. You can't take two mules and put them together. They don't make baby mules. Um, so it still is a living organism. It's just not a species because it can't interbreed. So this is kind of, like I said, the classical biological definition. I'll show you another example. Here's one here. So what do you get if you take a zebra and a horse? It's a zorse, of course. <laughs> So hopefully you guys like the joke. Uh, I actually saw one of these this summer. Actually, the one I saw was a zoni. Um, and uh, you know, it, it kind of looked like that. It was a lot more brown, but uh, it was very cute. This is also, by the way, uh, a sterile hybrid. It's not considered a species because they can't, they can't breed on their own. So this gets really complicated when you're starting to look at microorganisms. Um, it's not like there's male and female E. coli. Um, many of them don't mate. They actually produce asexually, uh, reproduce asexually, uh, and, and so there, there's no mating going on at all. Um, and sometimes you'll have uh, different kinds swapping DNA just kind of randomly. Uh, so that's kind of like breeding, but so it gets really complicated. And then viruses, of course, don't even re reproduce on their own. So when it comes to microorganisms uh, and we, we classify them as species, there's a few things we look at. Classically, you can see, uh, we look at things that I've just talked about, so things like cell shape. Is it a spherical shape? Is it a rod shape? Is it kind of like spirally? Uh, those kind of things, ability to be stained, does it turn purple or pink when you, when you give it a gram stain, for example? Or sometimes the biochemistry, does this uh, microorganism consume lactose? Uh, does it not consume lactose? Uh, those kind of things. Um, nowadays, because we have, we have uh, access to genetic information, um, often we're looking at, at uh, sequences uh, in their genomes. And usually we're looking at the ribosomal RNA sequences. And, and that, the reason for that is that all organisms have ribosomes, so they all have the genes for that. Uh, you can't just look at hemoglobin in humans and then, and then you know, expect a plant to have the same gene, for example. So the same thing with microbes. Uh, genes can be very different, but they all have RNA. This is the kind of the standard here. If things are two to 3% different, it's probably a new species. Um, 
People don't fully agree on that. If we use that for primates, there would be about three species of primates entirely. So this doesn't work for mammals, but this seems to be the standard for, uh, for most microorganisms. So how does this work exactly? Well, like I said, nowadays with computers, this is very easy. Uh, we do what is called a sequence alignment. So you can see in my example A here, so here's example A, uh, you have two organisms and uh, you, can, you can just see, is the sequence the same or is it not? Uh, what percentage of it is the same? So if it's 99% the same, it's probably the same organism. 98% the same, probably the same organism. 95% the same, uh, it's probably different, right? You're looking at that two to 3% uh, uh, difference is probably, uh, two, two to 3% is that kind of threshold. You can see example B here, uh, those are quite a bit more different and they're probably different organisms, but they still might be relatively closely related. Oh, same slide again, sorry about that. Uh, there's many disagreements, particularly when it comes to microorganisms. Um, I'll, I'll show you this example here. Uh, this organism here is called Bacillus cereus, or sometimes we short form is B cereus. Haha, B cereus, get the joke? <laughs> Thought you might like that. Um, and compare it to anthrax, so Bacillus anthracis right here. So what about these three organisms, right? So the Bacillus cereus, uh, you know, we're looking at the biochemistry, they have certain metabolic capabilities, uh, they can digest lactose, for example, and thankfully they do not have those toxins that make us sick that we'd find in anthrax. But here's the weird thing is, that if you compare these two isolates, anthrax and Bacillus, they're about 99% the same. Even though this, uh, this ATCC15479 doesn't have any of the toxins to make disease, it's still 99% the same. So some people say, well, they're clearly different species. This one, anthrax, is making us very sick and the other one is not. And, and other scientists are saying, well, maybe we should reclassify them as all as the same species and consider each of these to be subspecies or strains. But anyway, these are debates for biologists, not for this class. Uh, we really want to focus on, on some of the relevant things. I want to show you another one here, uh, E. coli, how complicated it can get. Um, here's, here's standard kind of lab E. coli. You can see it has about uh, 4,300 genes. And um, it, the sequence was published relatively early. Uh, you can see that's 23 years ago now. That was one of the you know, early genome sequences to come out. Uh, and then there's this 0157. And this is a very pathogenic, very nasty strain of E. coli. So if you take a look at it, it actually has, you know, more than like about 1,200 more genes. Um, so th this is very different in some ways. If we compare these two things, uh, they actually only share about 3,500 genes together. So this is really redefining what it means to be an organism in that these things are, are very different, but biologists continue to classify them as the same because so many, there are so many things the same about them. Uh, it gets even more complicated. Uh, here's a third strain of E. coli. And uh, so, you know, in this case here, you can see what the number is, is that about uh, 3,000 genes are the same, so maybe 40%. Yet we still classify them as the same species. So it gets very complicated, and there's interesting debates uh, raging around, around these kind of things. Because if you have that kind of difference, well, I'll show you in the next slide what that means if you were an animal. So take a look. Here's, uh, here's a human. If you're a male, your genome is about 99.9% .9 the same as all the other male humans on the planet. If you're a female, it's about the same. And it turns out females and males are only about 98.2% the same. We compare this with chimpanzees and other primates, you know, we're getting down into the low 90s and 80s in terms of percent the same. If you look at something like a mouse, 75, 92%. Uh, the reason why I have different numbers, by the way, is there's, there's different ways to do this kind of analysis. So these are just ballpark numbers. Fish, 73%. Birds, 60 to 65%. Insects, 45%. So just think about that for a second. You know, we have about the same genes, 45% so as, as an insect. That's more than two strains of E. coli, which is kind of crazy. Compare us to a worm. Sorry, that's a bad picture. I don't know what happened there about 38% of the same genes as a worm. So kind of crazy, some interesting stuff. Anyway, we're gonna move on here. 
So just some definitions for you. What is a species? So we were just talking about that. So classification is based on physical, metabolic, and genetic characteristics. And sometimes we can't agree uh, necessarily. But what is it? It means it's, it's its own kind. How do we define what its own kind is? Like I said, it really depends if you're talking about mammals compared to microorganisms. But usually a species is determined to be something that's separate and distinct for various reasons. So what's a strain? A strain is kind of like a breed. So if you think about dogs, you might have a poodle, uh, you know, or you might have a German shepherd, uh, but they're still dogs. Uh, same thing with E. coli. You can have all sorts of strains. Some of them are causing us to be sick. Some E. coli are not causing us to be sick at all. So strain, you'll see that, that word used a lot, or sometimes even subtype, say. So one other term for you, serotype. So serotype is, uh, is an old definition um, that people are still using, uh, and it's referring to uh, uh, how the immune system is recognizing uh, things on the surface of that cell. So it's kind of, like I said, an old system, but it's still stuck with certain species. Uh, Salmonella in particular are over a serotype. You still see that word. Uh, mostly we're trying to get away from it, but it's an old me mechanism of characterization. Okay, so let's talk about naming living organisms, because this is important, and this here is important for the, uh, for the quiz. Um, for the most part, we're using the binomial nomenclature system. Uh, and in this class, uh, it's important uh, for, for, for many organisms to know both the common name and the binomial name. But most organisms, are, uh, microorganisms at least, are going by their binomial, binomial name. So what do I mean by binomial? Binomial, bi is two, two names. Uh, sometimes you hear it called the scientific name or the Latin name. We usually use Latin or ancient Greek or some sort of, you know, dead language because we don't want to favor English or, or French or German or, or some other language like that. Um, the name, you're going to italicize it or underline it. Um, this is just a, a scientific convention, um, and I'm not really sure why that's the case, but that's, that's what we do. Uh, each organism has two names, genus and species. So here's an example, Homo sapiens. So this is the genus, notice it's capitalized. This is the species, notice it is not capitalized. And notice I have that uh, italicized. Uh, underlined is also acceptable, you know, particularly when people are handwriting things and whatnot, which won't come into play in this course. So I'll show you some names. Uh, names, uh, the best names are descriptive. So we already talked about Staphylococcus. So remember Staphylococcus, um, Staph is cluster, Coccus, is, uh, means spheres, but this is a different organism here. So this one here is aureus. So you may remember from your chemistry days, this particular element here, right? And maybe you remember, maybe you don't, but this is the element for gold. So on a Petri dish, these have kind of a golden color. So this is some growth of some cell colonies on a Petri dish. It's kind of a yellowy, goldy color. Compared to Staphylococcus epidermidis, both of these organisms live on your skin. But hey, epidermidis is already taken, so I can't use that name twice. So we're using a different characteristic of this organism. Uh, and something that makes it unique is it does grow a nice color on a petri dish. Here's another uh, organism you can see from the name. We've already got coccus, so you know they're round. And you can see they're kind of round as cells. Maybe that's not the best picture, but I just dug it up from Wikipedia. Dino. That's the same dino from dinosaur. I don't know if there's any dinosaur fans around here, and if you know what dinosaur means, dinosaur actually means terrible lizard. So dino, in this case, means terrible caucus. So why are they so terrible? Well, radiodurans means resistant to radiation. So this was uh, in the Guinness Book of World Records for the toughest bacterium. It was found in a nuclear reactor somewhere. And uh, it can survive something like 200 times the amount of radiation that would easily kill a human being. Uh, it turns out it, it's very tough, it survives all sorts of dehydration and, and uh, 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 temperatures and things like that. So I thought that was an interesting organism, but descriptive, right? Uh, sometimes they're named after people. Escherichia coli is named after a guy named Theodore uh, Escherich. And so given his name, um, 
I don't know, it was after he died, but I don't know if I would be too happy if, uh, if uh, you know, organism found in everyone's uh, stool was, was named after me, but uh, I guess that's the way it happened. Coli for colon, because it's found in the colon, right? Uh, Listeria, named after Joseph Lister. What about that one? Anyone see a name in there? Any Rolling Stones fans? So right there. Jaggerai, somebody named it after Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. So I guess the person who named this organism was a fan. Uh, how about this one here? Anyone see the name there? So whether you are a fan or not, um, you cannot deny the resemblance. So somebody, uh, I believe this is some sort of moth and uh, it had the, you know, the yellow comb over look and, and somebody said this is, you know, they could not resist. They had to name it after Donald Trump. Uh, this was actually uh, uh, not too long ago. So I thought that was something else uh, kind of interesting. There's, there's actually a number of these things named after people for various reasons. Okay, so I have a Kahoot for you. So I think I've got five questions on this Kahoot. So I'm going to load that up. So load up the app. There we go. So give you about uh, 20, 30 seconds for everyone to sign up and then we'll hit start. Okay, here we go. First question, what does a lysozyme do? Hey, good job. 39 people got that one right. It breaks down food particles. A lysozyme is like a cellular stomach. Good job, Lena. Watch out for Jaden and Helen. Question two, what is transcription? Okay, that one was a little harder. Um, just a warning to everybody, right? Uh, you have to read questions carefully with multiple choice. Uh, we're gonna be using a lot of technical language in this class, so it's really important that you do understand all the, all the, uh, the terminology here. Um, in particular, I, I, I did word this one a little tricky just to uh, you know, make it a little more difficult. Um, but if you take a look at this, the first one, the genetic code is used to make protein. So no, we're not making protein. Second one, mitosis, no one took that one. Process where DNA polymerase synthesizes a new chromosome, not quite. That one's replication. So the correct answer is we're making RNA, and we're making RNA using a DNA template. Okay, Lena is in the lead. Oh, and looks like there's a tie. Next question. What is a prokaryote? This one has multiple answers, so select all that apply. Okay, so turns out they're all right. Um, so I know that one's a little bit more difficult, but uh, 
just wanted to show you uh, what a different question would look like. I will not do that on a test or exam, by the way. You will not have multiple answers. Um, so, you know, don't worry about that one. Oh, some people are saying only let me pick one. Okay, that's odd. Um, I guess I'll have to do something with the settings. I guess the good news is there's no prizes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, one or two more questions. Which of the following are proper ways to name this dinosaur? So this one actually has multiple answers too, so I apologize if you can't choose more than one. Okay, so the blue one and the red one were correct. So again, I apologize if you can't uh, choose more than one. Um, something I can't remember was in my slides or if I forgot to mention is that often when we uh, have a species name, you have the genus, the species. So Tyrannosaurus rex, you can see the one, the first answer with the triangle is correct. It's underlined. Uh, and often after the first time you mention it, you can you abbreviate the species and just put the initial. So T rex is also correct and italicized. Uh, notice T rex, the one in the yellow or orange, uh, that's actually a kid's book. Tea is in, you know, the tea that you drink. I thought that one was cute. Uh, notice the last one is incorrect because the Rex is the species and it has a capital and that is not correct. The species is a small letter only. Okay, Nicole, coming in there out of nowhere. Good job. Okay, last question. Okay, that was intense. So yes, it's true. Quiz is on Tuesday, and it will be at uh, 10.30 at the beginning of class. Um, I will be sending you instructions once I have them. <laughs> uh, but basically, you'll log into Moodle, and you'll have, uh, you'll have a time limit to do it. Uh, so probably I will give people 10 minutes, and then uh, class will be starting um, after that. So if class is starting at 10.30, we'll do the quiz will be 10.30 to 10.40, and class will start at 10.40. Uh, so like I said, the quiz will be on Moodle. I just have to figure out how to program that. Again, this is kind of new, but I think, think I know what I'm doing. So we'll uh, get there when we get there. Let's see how the points add up. So number three, Shelby. Number two, Miriam. And number one, Nicole. All right, good job. Okay, so well played. We're gonna go back to uh, the PowerPoint now. Let's see here, there we go. Okay, so I did mention salmonella. Like I said, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, in biology, all sorts of exceptions. Things can get confusing. Salmonella is one area where things definitely get confusing. Um, has nothing to do with salmon, actually named after a guy, Daniel Salmon. And the species name is actually Salmonella enterica. And I will probably never use that species name because there are so many ways to name Salmonella. So usually I just call it Salmonella, that's it. Uh, and, and a lot of scientists do the exact same. So there's actually three types of salmonella and some people say there are three species usually the term is we see serovars and that's a serotype so that has to do with the immune system recognizing but they so that they have different names you can see here's the big official name for the first one salmonella enterica serovar typhi so sometimes this is just called salmonella typhi for example uh, and slightly different uh, in in terms of the symptoms people get and and in terms of the genes they have, uh, uh, it gets really complicated. So I'm just gonna call it salmonella and not worry about all the complications here. Uh, and, and just know that these are organisms that, uh, you know, typically, at least in Canada, are, are known for causing, uh, you know, what we call food intoxication or food poisoning. 
So what about naming viruses? Viruses are not usually considered organism, um, but they usually follow this general formula and they're not usually italicized. So some sort of descriptor and then the word virus. So here's some examples. Influenza virus. Uh, there's actually three types, so A, B, and C. So sometimes it's called influenza A virus. Uh, herpes simplex virus, one. So herpes simplex virus one uh, is the one that usually gives people cold sores, sometimes genital herpes, there's two types, so it has uh, a one and a two in front of it. Epstein-Barr virus, the descriptor is the name of the scientist who uh, studied Epstein-Barr. Uh, a number of viruses for, you know, are, have, have, uh, are now stuck with names that have to do with geographical location. So Ebola virus, that's actually a river found, I believe in the Democratic Re Republic of the Congo. Uh, so it was named after river where uh, the first case in 1976 was discovered. Uh, Norwalk virus, I believe that's Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, that one actually got renamed to norovirus, um, probably because the people of Norwalk were not too happy that a virus was named after their fine town. Spanish flu, that's not the name of a virus, but it's the name of the disease. And I'm just showing you that sometimes these uh, diseases get stuck with their geographical location. Uh, what about SARS-CoV-2? That's the new uh, virus that's floating around. Um, its full name is SARS coronavirus 2. SARS stands for the disease, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome. Coronavirus, corona, um, it doesn't mean the beer. It means, uh, it's, it means crown. And uh, so the, uh, the virus is kind of spiky. So, you know, the person who discovered it in the 1960s thought it looked a little bit like a crown. Uh, why coronavirus 2? Because SARS actually was a virus discovered in 19, or not 19, 2002, 2003. And so there is a SARS classic or a SARS 1. And so this one gets the number two. Okay, so just a quick whirlwind tour through the living world. And uh, this is what we're gonna be covering in the next few lectures, really. This is a lecture on each of these. We're gonna be a lecture on bacteria. It's gonna be a lecture on uh, fungi and protists, a lecture on animal parasites, and there'll be a lecture on uh, viruses and prions. Those are the next few weeks. We're gonna go into these things in a lot of detail. Uh, the prokaryotes, of course, include the archaea, no known pathogens. Uh, so we're, we'll, we'll come back to these uh, in a bit. I do wanna uh, kind of just go through this part quickly so I can talk about the quiz. There's our bacteria. I mentioned that uh, you know many of the, uh, they usually can, uh, contain peptidoglycan as part of their cell wall. Come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, here's the three common types, the rods, the spheres, and the spiral shapes. Uh, eukaryotes, um, you know, we're, in this uh, course, we're going to be talking about animals that infect us. So in this case here, uh, what do I mean by that? I, I mean worms for the most part. Uh, there are a few other things, but uh, some really nasty, creepy collies. Uh, we're also going to be talking about some vectors. So vectors means things that can spread disease. So ticks and mosquitoes, for example, are things that can spread disease. Uh, we're not going to be talking about plants, but I thought I'd show you this nice picture. I took this picture in Manitoba. It, uh, we're driving through. I, I stopped and saw these sunflowers, and they're absolutely gorgeous. But anyway, that's it for plants. I like plants. They're nice, but for this course, not so relevant. Uh, fungi. There's different types of fungi. There's mushrooms, there's molds, and there's uh, yeasts. So these are all sorts of different types that can have uh, can affect our health, and so we'll be we'll be discussing them in a lot of detail. Uh, the protists. So these are kind of like um, so these are eukaryotes, and they're not plants, animals, and fungi. And that really is the biological definition of protists. So it's sort of a catch-all, meaning things that aren't uh, cat uh, categorizing the other groups. So they're usually single cell, but there's lots of exceptions. Um, Biologically, you know, or, or medically anyway, we often call them the protozoa, and I'll talk about why that's a different word than protist uh, later. But these include things like amoebas. Uh, I mentioned the trypanosomes that cause uh, African sleeping sickness. Uh, there's uh, the organism that causes malaria. Uh, trichomonas, that's a sexually transmitted disease. Giardia is something that causes uh, a type of uh, diarrhea. So much more on them. And then there's viruses don't have cells, don't have nucleuses, don't have ribosomes. These are mostly just nucleic acids that are uh, protected by protein and sometimes uh, a membrane. And we're going to talk about prions, and these are infectious proteins. So again, much more on these later. 
These are not technically alive because they don't have cells. So a bit more on those later. Okay, so let's talk about that quiz. I know that's why everybody came out tonight today. Um, it's going to be 10 multiple choice. It's 5% of your grade. Um, here's some things that you should know for the quiz. So make sure that uh, you know all the parts of the cell and those processes. Uh, all the notes we took today about replication and transcription and translation. Uh, differences, uh, just the basic differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And you can see I have a couple other things listed there, naming conventions and uh, being able to at least rank them by size. Um, what's not on the quiz? Uh, some of the stuff from last week. So most of the last week's lecture will not be on the quiz. So history of microbiology. And um, you can see I say they're understanding the specific difference between types of microbes. Um, mostly the differences between, I do want you to know the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But don't worry about the difference between a fungi and a protist, for example. Uh, just focus on the notes that uh, we really did cover today. This will be uh, 10 multiple choice questions, uh, and like I said, on Moodle. So a couple of questions here. It says, are prokaryotes not alive either? Uh, no, prokaryotes are considered alive. They do, they do all fulfill all their requirements for life. They metabolize, they grow, they do all sorts of things like that. It says, what are we ranking them as? Ranking them by size. So last week we made a table. Uh, we talked about the basic size of things. So viruses are much smaller than bacteria. Bacteria are much smaller than protists and so on. So I do have a couple of sample questions for you and then we'll, we'll wrap up a lecture today. So you can see this one here. It says, um, the following component of the cell is responsible for manufacturing proteins. So you got all those cell parts and read the question carefully and the correct answer is the ribosome. Question two says transcription is the process where RNA is used as a template to make protein. Proteins are degraded by enzymes. DNA is used as a template to make messenger RNA. Amino acids are strung together to form proteins and E, none of the above. So transcription is making RNA. So correct answer is C. All right, I see you have a couple more questions here. Um, is the quiz on lockdown browser or is, is it at the beginning or the end of class? The quiz will be at the beginning of class. I will uh, send you some instructions uh, as soon as I have them put together. So I'm hoping I'll have the instructions by the end of the day tomorrow. Uh, the lockdown browser, I'm still uh, working out the kinks on that, so I don't have an answer on that yet. Uh, like I said, just uh, stay tuned for the instructions, please. And uh, once I have the details, I will I'll make sure I will share them with you uh, over, over email. So I think this is the last slide I have for today's lecture. Uh, good luck on the quiz. Uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can uh, let me know. Uh, you can call me during my office hours, or if you have any questions now, it's a good time. But I'm going to, if not, I will uh, 